أشرف الأعراب والعجم Uh, you guys did very well at those those answers. Well done, mashallah. Um, so I'm just going to quickly give those answers now before we get underway. And um, inshallah, the first question there, this was relating to the Hamra al-Assad invasion. And the first question there was, what was the reason for the Hamra al-Assad campaign? Um, following This was following the Battle of Uhud. Why was it that the Muslims of Medina, they went out and immediately prepared again for fighting? Um, and so this was on the eighth day of Shawwal, the month of Shawwal, just the next day after the Battle of Uhud. And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he spent that night pondering over the situation and he feared that those idolaters from Mecca, that they may return, uh, they were returning back to Mecca, but he thought that they might turn around again and try and attack the Muslims of Medina. Since their victory at Uhud, it wasn't all that really decisive. So the Messenger وسلم, decided to lead the Muslims out of Medina in pursuit of the Meccan army, and so they camped at this place called Hamra al-Assad. And sure enough, those polytheists, they stopped and then they started arguing with each other and most of them wanted to go back again to fight the Muslims. And the second question was, what did the Messenger وسلم, do to stop this scheme of the Meccans, to stop them turning back and going around to uh, attack the Muslims of Medina? Um, this man, Ma'bad bin Abi Ma'bad, he came to the Messenger وسلم, and he sympathized with the Muslims. Rasulullah asked him then to overtake Abu Sufyan, leading the polytheists, and exaggerate to him the number of Muslims in his pursuit so that uh, he would get the idea, you know, there was a, a huge number of Muslims just waiting to attack him. So um, that misinformation would make him give up any idea of attacking Medina. So that was the answer to that one, how the Messenger وسلم, stopped that uh, scheming of the Makkans to turn back and attack Medina. The third question was, did this plan work? And the answer was, of course, yes. Ma'bad, he joined up with the Quraysh and told them that Muhammad وسلم, had marched with a huge army to meet them. And so at that point, um, the Makkans, they all decided to return back to Makkah. And the final question there, how many days did the Messenger وسلم, and his men stay at that place, at Hamra al-Asad? And it was three days. Okay, inshallah, today we're going to read the story um, of the Battle of the Confederates. But first of all, uh, we're going to go to another set of questions relating to the class from last week. Um, that was all about the military missions in between the Battle of Uhud and the Battle of the Confederates. So we'll go to this new set of questions and inshallah later on we'll put them also on the Facebook page. And the first question relating to last week's class. Uh, there were two tragic incidents which took place during this same year, the fourth Hijri year. What were those two tragic incidents which we talked about in the class last week? Okay, this was in that time um, after the Battle of Uhud and before the next Battle of Ahzab, the Battle of the Confederates. There were two very tragic incidents which happened to the companions of the Prophet وسلم, during the same year. What were those two very tragic incidents? Can anyone remember from last week's class what we talked about? What were, what were those two very tragic incidents? And um, where did they take place?
Okay, this is relating back to uh, the class we did last week, the military missions in between the Battle of Uhud and the Battle of the Confederates. What were the two most tragic incidents which happened um, in that period to the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Okay, we've got a couple of answers there. Um, and uh, there was a large amount of information uh, in that class last week. So uh, we're a bit over the place here, but alhamdulillah, uh, the first, uh, the one answer on the screen there, the first when uh, the last six of the companions um, and there was the Rajir incident. So in fact uh, there were two tragic events, um, the Rajir incident and the Ma'una well incident. Okay, and um, these both took place in the month of Safar. And um, can anyone tell us what happened in the Rajir incident? Alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What happened in the Rajia incident, which we talked about last week? Was, this was a very tragic event which happened to the Muslims, to the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Can anyone tell us what happened in the Rajia incident? Okay, we're not getting any answers there. In the Rajia tragic event, 10 Muslim teachers, they were tricked and set upon by the disbelievers who killed them at a place called Rajia, a place between Jadda and Rabig. And uh, the next question is, uh, can anyone explain the background to this incident? Why were these ten companions singled out? Okay, this next question is explain the background to the Rajia incident and why were these ten companions singled out? Okay, once again, there was a large amount of information in last week's class, and uh, okay, we have an answer there on the screen. They were sent out to instruct the people in religion, but they got surrounded at Arajia and got attacked. So uh, what happened prior to that is that a delegation from a couple of tribes, they visited the Prophet Wasallam and asked him to send them a group of companions to teach them Islam. The Prophet Wasallam sent ten of his companions with them. When they reached that place called Rajir, 100 archers from one of the surrounding tribes uh, surrounded and attacked them. Seven Muslims were martyred and three captured. The captive who protested against the offenders breaking their agreement was also killed. Um, now there's a lot of questions here and I have a feeling we're not really getting warmed up to the questions. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to skip over all the questions and put them on the Facebook page and give you guys plenty of time to answer them in your own time because it will just take up too much time here in the class. So I'm just going to fly it forward over all these questions and we're going to read from today's class. And we're up to, ooh. okay, we're up to the Ahzab, the Confederates invasion. Bismillah rahman rahim Once again, peace and security enveloped the Arabian Peninsula. And this turbulent area began to experience a period of lull after a whole year of war. The Jews, however, whose treachery, intrigues, and disloyalty made them taste all types of humiliation and disgrace, were not admonished. After they had been exiled to Khaybar, they remained waiting anxiously for the results of the skirmishes going on between the Muslims and the idolaters. Contrary to their hopes, the events of the war were in favor of the Muslims. Therefore, they started a new stage of conspiracy and prepared themselves to deal a deadly blow against the Muslims, but were too cowardly to maneuver directly against them. So they laid a dreadful plan in order to achieve their objectives. Twenty chiefs of the Jews with some celebrities of Banu Nadir went to Mecca to negotiate an unholy alliance with the Quraysh. They began to goad the people there to attack the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, promising them full support and backing. The people of the Quraysh, who lacked interest and proved too weak to challenge the Muslims at Badr, seized this opportunity to redeem their stained honor and blemished reputation. The same delegation set out for Qatfan, called them to do the same and they responded positively. The Jewish delegation then started a fresh effort and toured some, some parts of Arabia and managed to incite the confederates of disbelief against the Prophet وسلم, his message and the believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quraysh, Kinana and other allies from Tihama in the south rallied ranked and recruited 4,000 men under the leadership of Abu Sufyan. From the east, there came tribes of Banu Salim, Qatifan, Banu Murra, and so on. They all headed for Medina and gathered in its vicinity at a time already agreed upon. It was a great army of 10,000 fighters. They, in fact, outnumbered all of the Muslims in Medina women, lads, and elders included. To tell the truth, if they had launched a surprise attack against Medina, they could have exterminated all the Muslims. However, the leadership inside the city was on the alert, and the intelligence personnel managed to survey the area of the enemies and reported their movement to the people in charge in Medina. Rasulullah summoned a high advisory board and conducted a careful discussion of a plan to defend Medina. After a lengthy talk between military leaders and people possessed of sound advice, it was agreed on the proposal of an honorable companion, Salman al-Farisi, to dig trenches as defensive lines. The Muslims, with the Prophet وسلم, at their head, encouraging, helping, and reminding them of the reward in the hereafter, most actively and diligently started to build a trench around Medina. Severe hunger, bordering on starva starvation, could not dissuade or discourage them from achieving their desperately sought objective. Salman radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when siege was delayed to us in Persia, we used to dig trenches to defend ourselves. It was really an unprecedented wise plan. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hurriedly gave orders to implement the plan. Each group of ten to dig. Sahil bin Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said we were in forty yards uh, 
was allocated the company of the Messenger وسلم, and the men used to dig and we evacuated the earth on our backs. Some supernatural prophetic signs appeared in the process of trenching. Jabir bin Abdullah radiallahu anhu seeing the Prophet وسلم, starving slaughtered a sheep. Cooked some barley and requested the Prophet وسلم, and companions to accept his invitation. But the Prophet وسلم, gathered all the thousand people engaged in digging the trench and they started to eat until they were all completely full and yet the shoulder of mutton and dough that was being baked remained as they were undiminished. A certain woman brought a handful of dates and passed by the Prophet وسلم, who took the dates, threw them over his cloak and invited his followers to eat. The dates began to increase in number until they dropped over the trim of his robe. Another miracle was that an obstinate rock stood out as an immune obstacle in the ditch. The Prophet وسلم, took the spade and struck the rock immediately, which immediately turned into a loose sand dune. And another version, Al-Bara said on Al-Khandaq, the trench day, there stood out a rock too immune for our spades to break up and therefore we went to see the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for advice. He took the spade and struck the rock, uttering in the name of Allah, Allah is great. The keys of Asham in Syria are mine. I swear by Almighty Allah, I can see its palaces at the moment. On the second strike he said, Allah is great, Persia is mine. I swear by Allah to Allah, I can now see the white palace of Madain. And for the third time he struck the rock which turned into very small pieces. He said, Allah is great, I've been given the keys of Yemen, I swear by Almighty Allah I can see the gates of Sana'a while I'm in my place. The same version was narrated by Ishaq. The northern part of Medina was the most vulnerable, all the other sides being surrounded by mountains and palm tree orchards. The Prophet وسلم, as a skillful military expert, understood that the Confederates would march in that direction, so the trench was ordered to be on that side. The Muslims went on digging the trench for several days. They used to work on it during the day and go back home in the evening until it had assumed its full dimensions militarily before the huge army of the idolaters, which numbered as many as 10,000 fighters, arrived and settled in the vicinity of Medina in the places called Al Asyal and Uhud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, Walamma ra'a al mu'minun al ahzab qalu hadha ma wa'adallahu wa rasuluhu wa sadaqallahu wa rasuluhu wa ma zaduhum illa imanan wa taslima. And when the believers saw Al-Ahzab, the confederates, they said, this is what Allah Ta'ala and his messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had promised us. And Allah Ta'ala and his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had spoken the truth. And it only added to their faith and to their submissiveness to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. 3,000 Muslims with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at their head came out to encounter the idolaters with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise of victory deeply established in their minds. They entrenched themselves in the Sila mountain with the trench standing as a barrier between them and the disbelievers. On attempting to attack the Muslims and break into Medin, the idolaters were surprised to see a wide trench, a new stratagem unknown in Arabia before standing as an obstinate obstruction. Consequently, they decided to lay siege to Medina and began to maneuver around the trench, trying hard to find a vulnerable spot through which they could infiltrate into Medina. To deter their armies from approaching by bridging any gap in their defenses, the Muslims hurled arrows and engaged in skirmishes with them. The veteran fighters of the Quraysh were averse to this situation, waiting in vain in anticipation of what the siege might reveal. 
Therefore, they decided that a group of fighters led by Amr bin Abdi Wood, Ikrima bin Abi Jahl, and Dira ibn Khattab should work its way through the trench. They, in fact, managed to do that, and their horsemen captured a marshy area between the trench and Sil'a mountain. Amr, Amr radiallahu anhu yeah. Amr challenged the Muslims to a duel and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu was deputed. After a short but fierce engagement, Ali radiallahu anhu killed Amr and obliged the others to evacuate in a state of panic and confusion. However, some days later the polytheists conducted fresh desperate attempts but all of them failed due to the Muslim steadfastness and the heroic confrontation. In the context of the events of the trench battle, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam failed to observe some prayers in their right time. Jabir radiallahu anhu narrated on the day of the trench, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu came, cursing the disbelievers of the Quraysh and said, O oh Allah Ta'ala's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have not offered the afternoon prayer and the sun has set. The Prophet ﷺ replied by Almighty Allah, I have not offered the prayer yet. And the Prophet ﷺ then went to Bhutan, performed ablution and observed the afternoon prayer after the sun had set and then offered the sunset prayer after it. He was so indignant for this failure that he invoked Allah Ta'ala's wrath on his enemies and besought Allah Ta'ala to fill their houses and graves with fire because they distracted him from observing the afternoon prayer. And it was narrated by Ahmad and Shafi that the events of that battle detained him from the noon, afternoon, evening and night prayers, but he observed them combined. The different narrations point to the fact that the situation lasted for a few days. It's clear that, and because of the trench standing between the two parties, no direct engagement took place, but rather there were military activities confined to arrow hurling. Consequently, the fight claimed the lives of a small number of fighters, six Muslims and ten polytheists, one or two killed by sword. During the process of fighting, Sa'ad bin Mu'av <coughs> was, was shot by an arrow that pierced his artery. Perceiving his end approaching, he invoked Allah Ta'ala, saying, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know nothing is closer to my heart than striving in your way. Against those people, the disbelievers, who belied your messenger and banished him from his town. Almighty Allah, I deeply believe that you have decreed that we should fight them. So if there is still more fighting to go with them, let me stay alive in order to strive more against them. If it has settled down, I beseech you to ignite it again so that I breathe my last in its context. He concluded his supplication beseeching Almighty Allah not to let him die until he had full revenge on Banu Quraidah. In the midst of these difficult circumstances, plotting and intrigues were in fervent action, in action against the Muslims. The chief cr criminal of Banu Nadir, Huyay, headed for the habitations of Banu Quraida to incite their chief Ka'ab bin Asad al-Qurazi who had drawn a pact with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to run to his aid in times of war. Ka'ab in the beginning resisted all Huyay's temptation but Huyay was clever enough to manipulate him speaking of the Quraysh and their notables and al Asyal as well as Qatfan and their chieftains entrenched in Uhud, all in one mind, determined to exterminate Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers. He moreover promised to stay in Ka'ab's fort, exposing himself to any potential danger in case the Quraysh and Ghatfan withdrew. The wicked man went on in this manner until he later managed to win Ka'ab to his side and persuade him to break his covenant with the Muslims. 
Banu Quraida then started to launch war operations against the Muslims, especially the secluded garrisons that housed the women and children of the Muslims. On the authority of Ibn Ishaq, Safiya radiallahu anha, daughter of Abdul Muttalib, happened to be in a garrison with Hassan bin Thabit, as well as some women and children. Safiya radiallahu anha said a Jew was spotted lurking around our site, which was vulnerable to the enemy attacks because there were no men to defend it. I informed Hassan that I was suspicious of that man's presence near us. He might take us by surprise now that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslims are too busy to come to our aid. Why don't you get down and kill him? Hassan answered that he would not do it. So I took a bar of wood, went down and struck the Jew to death. I returned and asked Hassan to loot him, but again Hassan refused to do that. This event had a far-reaching effect and discouraged the Jews from conducting further attacks, thinking that those sites were fortified and protected by Muslim fighters. They, however, went on providing the idolaters with supplies in token of their support against the Muslims. On hearing this bad news, the Messenger وسلم, dispatched four Muslim prominent leaders, Sa'ad bin, Sa bin Mu'adh, Sa'ad bin Ubadah, Abdullah bin Rawaha, and Khawat bin Jubair, may Allah be pleased with them all, for investigation but warning against any sort of spreading panic among the Muslims and advising that they should declare in public that the rumours are groundless if they happen to be so. Unfortunately, the four men discovered that the news was true and that the Jews announced openly that no pact of alliance existed any longer with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah was briefed on the situation and the Muslims understood their critical position with the horrible danger implied therein. Their back was vulnerable to the attacks of Banu Quraida and a huge army with no way to connive at in front while their women and children unprotected standing in between. In this regard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran and when the eyes grew wild and the hearts reached to the throats and you were harboring doubts about Almighty Allah, there the believers were tried and shaken with a mighty shaking. Now that the Muslims were shut in within the trench on the defensive, the hypocrites taunted them with having indulged in delusive hopes of defeating Kisra, the Emperor of Persia, and Caesar, Emperor of the Romans. They began to sow the seeds of defeatism and pretended to withdraw for the defense of their homes, though these were in no way exposed to danger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again in the Holy Quran, وَإِذْ يَقُودُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِنْ مَرَدٌ مَا وَعَدَنَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا وَإِذْ قَالَ الطَّائِفَةٌ يَا أَهْلَ يَثْلِبَ لَا مُقَامَ لَكُمَ فَارْجِعُوا here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is a disease of doubt said, Allah ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised us nothing but delusions. 
And when a party of them said, O people of Yathrib and Medina, there is no stand possible for you against the enemy attack, therefore go back. And a band of them asked for permission of the Prophet saying, Truly our homes lie open to the enemy, and they lay not open. They but wished to flee. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrapped himself in his robe and began to meditate on the treachery of Banu Quraidah. The spirit of hopefulness prevailed over him and he rose to his feet saying, Allah Ta'ala is great. Listen you Muslims to Allah Ta'ala's good tidings of victory and support. He then started to lay decisive plans aiming at protecting the women and children and sent some fighters back to Medina to guard them against any surprise assault by the enemy. The second step was to take action that could lead to undermining the ranks of the disbelieving confederates. There he had in mind to conclude a sort of reconciliation with the chiefs of Ratfan on the basis of donating them a third of Medina's fruit crops. He sought the advice of his chief companions, namely Sa'ad bin Mu'ad and Sa'ad bin Ubada radiallahu anhuma, whose reply went as follows. O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it is Allah Ta'ala's injunction, then we have to obey. But if it is a new course you want to follow just to provide security for us, then we don't need it. We experience those people in polytheism and idolatry and we can safely say that they don't need the fruit of our orchards. They rather need to exterminate us completely. Now that Allah Ta'ala has honoured us with Islam, I believe the best recourse in this situation is to put them to the sword. Thereupon the Prophet Sallallahu corrected their belief saying, my new policy is being forged to provide your security after all the Arabs have united to annihilate you, the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious and the exalted, praise is to him, created something that led to the dissension of the enemies of Islam and later on to their full defeat. A man from the tribe of Ghatfan named Naim bin Mas'ud asked to be admitted in the audience of the Prophet ﷺ, he declared that he had embraced Islam secretly and asked the Prophet ﷺ to order him to do anything that might benefit the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ asked him to do anything that could help the Muslims in the present distress and use any stratagem of avail. The man and a shuttle movement between the Jews, the Quraysh and the Ghatfan managed to incite each party to let down the other. He went to see the chiefs of Banu Quraidah and whispered in their ears not to trust the Quraysh nor fight with them unless the latter pledged some hostages. He tried to lend support to his council by claiming that the Quraysh would forsake them if they perceived the, that victory over Muhammad was far-fetched and the Muslims then would have a terrible revenge on them. Naim then headed for the camp of the Quraysh and managed to practice a similar stratagem in its final result but different in content. He claimed that he felt the Jews regretted breaching their covenant with Muhammad and his followers. He told them that the Jews maintained regular correspondence with the Muslims to the effect that the Quraysh hostages be sent to the camp of the Muslims with full Jewish allegiance paid to them as already agreed upon. Naim then exhorted the Quraysh not to send hostages to the Jews. On a third errand, he did the same with the people of Ghatfan. On Saturday night, in the month of Shawwal, the fifth Hijri year, both the Quraysh and Ghatfan dispatched envoys to the Jews, exhorting them to go into war against Muhammad The Jews sent back messages that they would not fight on Saturday. They added that they needed hostages from them to guarantee their consistency. On receiving the replies, the Quraysh and Ghatfan came to believe Naim's words fully. Therefore they sent a message to the Jews, again inviting them to war and asking them 
to preclude that condition of hostages. Naim's scheme proved successful. In a state of distrust and suspicion among the disbelieving allies prevailed and reduced their morale to a deplorable degree. Meanwhile, the Muslims were preoccupied supplicating their Lord to protect their home and provide security for their families. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on his part invoked Allah Ta'ala's wrath on the Confederates, supplicating, O oh Allah Ta'ala, you are quick in account. You are the sender of the book. We beseech you to defeat the Confederates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious and the exalted, responded to the call of the Muslims on the spot. Coupled with the dissension and variance that found their way into the hearts of the disbelievers, forces of nature, wind, rain and cold wearied them. Tents were blown down, cooking vessels and other equipment overthrown. That very cold night, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dispatched Hudhaifa bin al-Yaman to hunt around for news about the enemy. He found out that they were preparing to leave frustrated for their inability to achieve their target. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, did really fulfill his promise, spared the Muslims fighting a formidable army supported his servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and inflicted a heavy blow on the Confederates. The Battle of the Trench took place in the 5th Hijri year. The siege of Medina started in Shawwal and ended in Dhul Qa'ada and it lasted for over a month. It was in fact a battle of nerves rather than of losses. No bit of fighting was recorded, nevertheless it was one of the most decisive battles in the early history of Islam and provided beyond a shadow of doubt that no forces, however huge, could ever exterminate the nascent Islam. <laughs>